Um, well, it's great to see you. My name's Rich, and um, I lead the church. And if I've not met you, then welcome to you. Um, we're in this two weeks where we're revisiting our vision as a church and asking again, what's it that God has called us to do in our time? And how do we play our part in that? What is it that God has called us to? And how do we as a whole church play our part in living out our vision? So I spoke last week on that. Uh, and I'm going to continue today. And then the next few weeks, as we head towards Christmas and Advent, we're going to look more specifically at what does it mean for us to be church um, at this moment, and what is it that God is calling us to do together. I don't know if you ever look out at the world and think to yourself, uh, surely it can change. Surely it can be better. Whether you look at um, children, and the way our children are being raised, and um, the kind of environment they're being raised in and there's so many good things but I wonder if you ever look at it and think surely we can do better for this generation surely we could raise them in a different world create a better world for them surely we could do something about child poverty about poverty of opportunity surely we could create an environment where our children could grow up to flourish and fulfill the potential that God has placed in every person I don't know if you ever uh, hear about young people, teenagers, and uh, the things happening in our cities and our towns with them, and the ways uh, they're drawn often through social media and the various things of our world, all of which are neutral in terms of whether they're good or bad. It's what we do with them that really matters. But our teenagers, well, you ever look at it and think, surely, surely by now, we could have created the kind of community where our young people, our teenagers, can grow up to be secure in their identity and step fully into their purpose. Or whether, like me, you look around you and see the number of people who are struggling in their 20s and 30s, the epidemic of loneliness in our culture, and think to yourself, surely by now some of these problems that we face, we could have done something about them. Maybe you look around and you think about the way that we talk about those seeking asylum and refugees, those who are coming, many of whom are fleeing persecution for their Christian faith. But anyone who's fleeing persecution, maybe you look at them and think, by now, surely we could have found a way to welcome people into our society and seen the amazing benefits that meeting people from different cultures has for us. Surely something could change. Maybe like me, you look at the news and you hear stories of conflict and difficulty in our world and you think to yourself, when, Lord, when will it change? That's why vision is so important because vision speaks into the reality and calls out a different future. It agrees with all those who say this is not how it's, that it might be different, it ought to be different. Our vision is to see individuals, the church and our communities come alive in Jesus' name. Our vision is not the answer to the question. We can't on our own do it. But maybe we could play a part. Maybe we could be part of the solution to a world like ours. Maybe, just maybe, God would give us the privilege and the honour of joining him in the renewal of all things, preparing the way for his eventual return, that we might in our time see something of the kingdom of God come. Our vision is our answer to the question, what can we do? What can we do? We can call out life in Jesus' name for every individual. Maybe you're sat here today and you're thinking to yourself, I need new life. Jesus wants to bring life to you. Jesus himself said, I've come to give you life and life in all its fullness. Maybe um, today you're sat there thinking, how can our communities be better? What might I do in that? Maybe Jesus placed you in a place right now, a job, a position, amongst the community, at a school gate, on a street, amongst neighbours, where it's your actual role is to call out life in the people around you. And maybe God has asked us as a church to demonstrate what it might look like for the church to be alive in our generation. This is our vision. Today I want to talk about uh, how you might play your part in that. And there's three things we always say that you can do. Uh, You can play your part by praying. Uh, We need to keep on praying, don't we? Let's have the screen, please, Alexander. We need to keep on praying. Uh, Secondly, by volunteering, by giving of your time. 
I'm so thankful for those who volunteer their time amongst us. On Thursdays, uh, you see it in our asylum uh, seeker and refugee drop in. Um, we see, I see it on, these are the times when I see it on Fridays, on Sundays, uh, but I know it's going on through the week. On Wednesdays, through Bloom and uh, Little Ones, you should never ever start a list, by the way. Uh, in our worship teams, all of the places where people volunteer their times, we're so grateful for you. But today, I want to talk to you specifically about giving financially. What does it look like to give financially to a vision? This is a conversation we need to have as a family. So if you're visiting today, then welcome to you. Feel free to listen in. Because how we talk about money says something about us as a community. It says how we view it, how we use it. It says what our heart is and what we're up to. Um, so I'm going to do that. And I know for some people, maybe when I talk about giving, it's, um, it causes all kinds of responses for you. Uh, we'll talk about that sometime too. But today I want to just talk very clearly with you about um, where our giving comes from and then present to you some values around uh, giving, if that's okay with you. So there's three ways that our church um, operates financially through uh, the week, through the months and through the year. Uh, First of all, we have the giving of the church. And so I want to say thank you to everyone here who gives financially to our church. We would not have come this far without your generosity and your choice to give. We're really, really thankful for you. Uh, Together, we have managed to do this this far. And look how far we've come. So thank you to everyone who gives financially to our church. Uh, Second way we receive money is through our funding partners. Uh, Over the last few years, we've received funding from the Strategic Development Fund of the Church of England. Uh, That means as a Church of England, we've chosen certain places to say, we want to see in these places new life. Uh, That funding will come to an end over the next two years, but we're really grateful for it. And what it's managed to do is boost what it is that God was already doing through this church. Uh, And thirdly, through our reserves. Um, We have an amount of reserve in our account. Um, Our commitment as a church council is to keep two months operating capital uh, and to spend all the other reserves that we have on God's call for us to reach those around us. At the moment, we carry a little bit too much reserve and it's time for us to spend that reserve so that we can get back to relying on the Lord to provide for us month by month. We talked about this as a church council. Our reserves down to two months of operating capital. We're going to spend the rest and we're going to trust God to provide for us going forward. Um, I remember when we first came here, uh, we arrived with um, a little bit of seed funding. I think we had um, £50,000 from our we had £50,000 from the Church of England. And then as a group of those of us who moved from Sheffield, we had about £12,000 that we'd managed to uh, kind of um, beg, steal and convince our friends to give us as we came here. Uh, our initial building project, just to reopen the building, was £200,000. Um, then we had taken on staff. They all worked part-time, which we were really grateful for. But nevertheless, we had to pay them. Uh, We arrived and our building was condemned because the electrics didn't work. We had to fix that. There was no heating. We had to fix that. We had to paint as much as we could next door. And then we had to trust God to provide for us. I loved those days where we were trusting God month by month. Like, are we going to make it this month? Uh, We went through a building project. And uh, to renovate this building, I remember um, I was meeting with the architect the next day. And I remember writing in my journal, Lord, I think we need, like, need £35,000 to be able to sign this contract. I actually didn't know if I signed the contract what would have happened, but I was new to this. So I was like, sounds fine, let's meet with them. Um, and that morning of the meeting, we got a phone call from someone Um, nevertheless, that's what we did. They were really good days. They were good days because we felt as though, on a monthly basis, the Lord really was our provider. Uh, partly, we need to keep reserves to um, have an, a like, legal, functional charity. And an organization of our size that spends this much money must do that. But we must be careful that we keep on relying on the Lord. Uh, last week, I spoke about four, um, four priorities for our vision. Uh, first, I said we want to follow Jesus together. Uh, money helps us follow Jesus together. Let me be straightforward with you. These buildings cost loads and loads of money to keep going. Uh, the heating broke last week. It's back today, but we had to pay someone to come and fix it. Um, on a weekly basis, we spend loads of money just keeping it warm and lit. 
Uh, but spending money to invite people to come and follow Jesus together. Uh, when we spend money, we're also reaching out to our community and saying, would you like to know about Jesus? Through things like Alpha and Summerfest. All of these things are us investing into our priority that we will be a community that follows Jesus together. Secondly, we said we want to invest in a generation. And we did a UV party on Friday night with our young people. It cost money to do it. We had to put investment into it. Uh, this week, we'll do a glow-in-the-dark party. We want to invite as many young people from our community to come and have a great time in a great place amongst a great community so they might hear the great news of Jesus Christ. This is what our money does. It enables us to invest in a generation. Um, we're funding Growing Hope. By funding Growing Hope, we're investing in a whole generation. This is what our money does. Number three, standing with those in crises. Uh, by our money, we're able to put money into standing with those in crises. So this week, over the next two days, we will have over 70 families come and join us for our holiday club. Not all of them are in crisis, of course, but some of them, I'm sure, will be like all of us are at some point in our life. By being able to open our building, provide lunch, provide great activities, we're able to stand with those in crisis. We do that in other ways too, through our debt centre. We're able to stand with those in crises. Uh, on Thursdays, those who are seeking asylum here, opening our building up, providing lunch, we're going to expand that over the coming year. But we won't be able to do any of that unless we're able to fund it. And fourthly, welcoming all nations. And that's partly through, of course, our refugee drop-in. But one of the things that we've committed to as a church is to say, how do we look out now and say, where in the world could we invest as a community? Where could we find an international partner? So we're not just welcoming all nations here, but we're genuinely making a difference in the world outside of these walls. I'll say more about that. Uh, last week I said for our vision and our four priorities that we were the people of God and the presence of God. God has given us an amazing opportunity. It's an amazing privilege to, for me to be able to lead this church. I'm so grateful to God that he's given me this opportunity. The people of God have a role to play in it alongside the presence of God. God in his wisdom has chosen to work with humanity. And it's our generation right now who get to determine what we do as a church. The people of God and the presence of God. All of the other ways that people give to our church through prayer, through time and their talents are really important. But specifically today, I want to talk about how we can be generous with our money. If you turn with me to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, I'm going to read just a short bit of this. But let me give you some context about the letters to the Corinthians because it's a really interesting little section of Corinthians that we're in. Paul is writing to this church, Corinth. Corinth, if you don't know, uh, they loved to be really, really spiritual. They were like the spiritual gurus of their day. They were like, we have got this down. I imagine worship was amazing. I think you'd probably go home with a prophetic word, a little bit of an encouragement. At prayer time, you'd kind of feel like you met the Lord. Uh, they were really, really, really into the spiritual things. And Paul is constantly challenging them not to be proud and to remember all the other churches around them and to take the place of humility. And in chapter 8 and 9 of Corinthians, he writes to the church there and he talks about the collection for the Lord's people. Um, there's a time of hardship facing the church in Jerusalem and Paul has written to a number of churches across the uh, first century church and said to them, maybe it's time for you to give some money to help the church in Jerusalem. And um, Paul says to them all kinds of things about that. It's an amazing idea, isn't it, just right at the beginning of the first century, that um, Gentile churches would be sending money to a Jewish church in Jerusalem. The kind of crossing already of um, different cultural backgrounds and money moving across the church to support those uh, who didn't have it. And he praises the church in Macedonia in particular, who's gone through a really difficult time and who have given nonetheless. And it seems from his writing to the church in Corinth that the church in Corinth have promised, have pledged to give some money towards this collection for the Lord's people. And then here's what he says to them in chapter 9, verse 6. Remember this. 
Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work, as it is written. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Just notice that for a moment. This is not just about supplying a need or that's important but it's also overflowing in thanks to God. Because of the service by which you approved yourselves others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you their hearts will go out for you, to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his un, indescribable gift. Um, I want to share with you three values from this passage and three values that I want to suggest to you as values for us around giving. But just notice that Paul's approach to giving here and generosity is not kind of a, at all begrudging and it's not heavy. It's like it's a gift it's amazing. It reminds us that God provides for us. It lifts people up. It causes praise. It causes joy. I don't know about you, but I would like my view of money and of giving to be one that causes within me such joy that I can be like, it's an indescribable gift that I get to give. It's an indescribable gift that I get to share in this ministry. Um, I'm not there yet, but we'll say more about that shortly. But I want to suggest to you three values around being generous, around giving. Uh, today and values are who we are when we're at our best so of course not all of the time uh, we're able to live up to our values but we try to values describe who we are when we're at our best and the first thing I want to say to you is this be intentional first value around giving is to be intentional do you know I never accidentally achieved any of the things I aim to achieve in my life I wish that I could accidentally become fit do you know what I mean? Like, just kind of like, at one day, just kind of be like, oh gosh, I'm so fit. How, how did this happen? You know, I accidentally like to become amazing at yoga so I could like be so flexible. But it's not, I, you know, just, it's not going to, I mean, I could accidentally, of course, hurt myself. But that wouldn't be the same thing, right? Um, I'm not accidentally going to be able to raise my children the way I want to. It's going to take intention. I've never been accidentally able to do many things. I've always had to be intentional about it. When we think about our money, we should be intentional about how we think about our money, by what it is we want to do. Let me ask you this question. What is it you want to do in the world with your life? When you get to the end and you look back, what is it you would like to have done with your life? What would you have liked to have made a difference in? Where would you like to be like, I oh, really, you know, I was so intentional. I deliberately and intentionally did these things. And as I look back now, I can see the impact that I've had. And that with those around me, I've been able to have. Be intentional about it. And Paul says that, doesn't he? says, give what you've decided to give. Spend some time thinking it through. How might I use my money? What has God given me? And how might I use it today? What can I sow into? So that 10, 20, 30, 50, who knows? Maybe even beyond our lifetimes, 100 years from now, 200 years from now, the lasting impact is there because I was intentional about how I wanted to use things. Jesus said that you should think about where your treasure is because that's where your heart is. In Matthew 6, let's have the slide please, Alexander. In Matthew 6, 21. Um, I wondered if I looked at my bank account today, if I was to bring it out before you, uh, where you would see my heart is right now. 
Uh, hopefully you'll see that my heart is invested in a number of projects in the world. There's a number of things that we've chosen to invest into. But you'd also be like, it seems like you're kind of invested in um, American entertainment, Rich. Disney Plus, really? Um, Netflix, Amazon Prime, you, do, you really need things to come the next day? So I think you would see like, some of the things I'm invested in and some of the things I maybe wouldn't want to admit that I'm invested in, but I'm nevertheless still invested in. But where your treasure is, there your heart is. For us as a church, where our treasure is will reflect where our heart is. So what we as a church invest into in the coming years will reflect really what it is that we as a church value. So if we invest into raising a generation, if we invest into helping those in crisis, if we invest into not just at welcoming all nations, but actively and proactively looking for a partner where we could invest money and say, we're going to do something um, in this place, then you'll see that that's where our heart is too. That our heart really was raising a generation. Our heart really was in helping those in crisis. Our heart really was welcoming all nations, really was for change. It really was into it. So be intentional. What is it you want to do with your life? What is it you want to look back on years from now and say, I can see that I made choices. And being intentional as well helps us to put things in the right order. Jesus said this in Matthew 6. No one can serve two masters if you'll hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Being intentional with our money is also about intentionally making God higher than our money. It's intentionally saying, I will live for something other than material wealth. Um, a hands of you remember the offering basket we used to, you know, used to get passed around. Or maybe you went to one of those churches that had a kind of a velvet pouch. You know, you kind of came along, you weren't sure what to do. Uh, you took some stuff out of your pocket, you put some chewing gum in, a couple of pounds. Uh, maybe you took something out, um, whatever. Um, you know, that was a weird thing to do, wasn't it? But what was really powerful about that was you took a moment in your gathered life to say to God, we want to thank you that you provide for us and we want to offer back to you what we have. And there's something we've lost in the giving moment that's not about kind of like manipulating people to give more money, but is about recognizing that God is the one who's given me what I have and it's his anyway. So one of the things we're going to do as a church is we're going to try to bring that back. Not, we're not going to pass a velvet pouch around, although hands up if you think that sounds fun. Uh, or a basket, or a bucket, or anything like that. I mean, in my church growing up, we used to dance to the front and put the money on the table. Well, not so much dancing for me, but some of our church used to dance. Um, we don't need to do it like that, but we do need to find a time in our gathering to pause and thank God and say, Lord, you're bigger than my money and you provided for all of my needs and this week I choose again to give you back my money. And why don't we just for a moment just pause and thank God for all that he's given us. Why don't you just, where you are now, Holy Spirit, we thank you. And maybe just ask the Lord to show you what he's given you. And Lord, we want to acknowledge that you are our provider. And Lord, we intentionally choose you over money today. And we make you higher than it, Lord. And we thank you. And we say, Lord, would you speak to our hearts again about how it is we're to use it in Jesus' name. Amen. So that's what we're going to do. From next week onwards, a giving moment in every gathering, we're going to pause, we're going to thank God for his, offer, his gift to us, and we're going to offer back our lives and all our resources to him. And number two, give with joy. Um, it says this, doesn't it? Um, um, God loves, don't do it under compulsion or reluctantly, for God loves a cheerful, and the word's actually a hilarious giver. A, a, I, don't know, I don't actually know what it means to be a hilarious giver. Maybe you just tell jokes as you give. Who knows? But um, this idea that we're not to give under compulsion or reluctantly. This is not me trying to say to you that if you don't give, we're mad at you. We're not at all. You're really welcome. This isn't about that. This is about what's best for us. 
It's not what we want from you. It's what we want for you. It's not what I want um, for my, uh, from my children. It's what I want for them. That they'll grow up to be people who are generous. And uh, the Bible says, give with joy. Give with joy. Be hilarious about your giving. Cheerful about it. How do you do that? Well, I think it starts by having an encounter with Jesus. It's about knowing who he is and what he's done for you and the way he's rescued us and the transformation he brings. And there's something about when you begin to see him and when he moves in you that it overflows in generosity and so you're able to give with joy. In Luke 19, Luke the evangelist tells us about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a very little man, that's right. And he was also a tax collector who um, had compromised around money. And he was excluded from his community because of his compromise about money. Money was the greatest thing in his life. One day Jesus sees him and says to Jesus, uh, says to Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house for dinner tonight. And Zacchaeus comes down from the tree, takes Jesus round to his house, throws a party. And we're told in that story that all of the religious people are like, oh gosh, what's Jesus doing? Hanging out with this kind of terrible person. And Zacchaeus suddenly stands up and says to them, I want to say this. I'm going to give all, all of my money away. Half of it, if I've wronged you, and if anyone else has done it, if anyone else, you can have it too. And it's like this joyful moment that because he's met with Jesus, the religious are stood being like, oh, t- you know, you shouldn't be doing that with the money. Like you shouldn't like kind of like having a problem with it. But Zacchaeus is suddenly free from the bounds of money. And with joy, it's like, hey, you guys, look, have all of it. I don't need it anyway. I'm, I'm happy to pay back anyone who needs to be paid back. And if there's anyone who's been wronged, I can kind of make it up to you in double the amount. It's an amazing story. He is able to give with joy in that moment. Because he's had an encounter with Jesus. Jesus transforms him. That's what Jesus says. He says, salvation has come to this house today. And that word salvation is the word so-so, which means transformation. He's transformed the heart of Zacchaeus so that money is no longer the biggest thing in his life and he's able to give with joy. And perhaps today you struggle with money. We, so many of us struggle to give with joy. Maybe Jesus wants to encounter you again so that you can release the burden that money can be, and learn to grow, give with joy. And thirdly, grow in generosity. We want to grow in generosity. Generosity is not just something that happens like one day you suddenly wake up and be like, oh my goodness, I'm so generous today. It's a, it's a, it's a journey. It's a, an ex, a time thing. It's about being a disciple. It's about what happens to us as we learn to follow him. Yeah, my own story is that um, I, I didn't really grow up with very much. I mean, my parents did their best, but I grew up in Sheffield in a recession. I was born in the 1980s. I grew up in the 1990s. We didn't really have money for many things. Um, we, um, I, you know, we, we couldn't afford to join a fo- play football. Um, we couldn't afford to do all kinds of things. We walked everywhere. It was like difficult, and that impacted me when it came to money. It impacted me to the point where actually I was just wasn't sure like what to do. I just never had it and never known how to use it and felt like it would always run out. And my journey as a disciple has been one of learning to trust God that he will provide and that I don't have to be bound by that. You know, um, Jesus lives in my heart, but grandpa still lives in my bones. Sometimes I need to like keep coming back to him and saying, like, Lord, I still have this kind of inherit- inheritance, this heritage of feeling like there won't be enough. But Lord, I've, when I look back, I can see that there has been and there will be. Um, being um, with Louisa has helped me with that. She is good at generosity, but there's been many times when I've been like, really? Why don't we just do them baked potatoes? It's fine. You don't need to buy meat as well. Beans as well. <laughs> and cheese. Do the children really need Christmas presents this year? I mean, really? And I think that for me, in my own journey with the Lord, it's been one of trying to grow in generosity, step by step. How do you do that? Well, partly you become generous like Jesus is generous towards us. In Corinthians 8, 2 Corinthians 8, just before, Paul says to them, do you remember how Jesus, who had everything, 
became nothing for you to show you the incredible riches of his grace towards you. Do you remember that? And Paul says, remember how Jesus poured himself out, and gave it all away for you. You too can follow his example, trusting that he's really generous towards you, that he's kind towards you, that he provides for you. Becoming generous like Jesus says this, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Jesus has given us everything. He's our example of how we're to live. Because of him, we're, open, we're brought into the place of his blessing. He's given us more than just material things. All of the spiritual things we need, all of the resources of heaven, a promise that there's more beyond this life. And generosity is a journey. We want to grow in generosity as a church and as followers of Jesus. And one of the things I've been really convicted about in my leadership of the church, and that was at a conference just the other week, and a guy called Richard Garnett stood up, and he's dying, he's terminally ill, and he stood at the front, and he talked about his own journey of generosity, and how he just didn't want to be generous, but God kept challenging him to be so. And he had the HTB churches gathered, and he said to the HTB churches, you guys have been amazing at doing all kinds of things in this country and bringing about transformation, but I have a challenge for you. Where do you invest in ministry that does not serve the agenda of your church? Where do you just invest because it's a good thing to do in something else. And uh, I mean, it was like, I was sat there thinking, I don't know if this is, I don't know if this is for me. I'll, I'll leave, you guys stay. But um, it challenged me because we as a church have so much. So one of the commitments we're making is to say, okay, let's find ways to invest some of the money that comes into our church through giving in things that do not serve our agenda, that don't do any benefit for us. Uh, the obvious thing for us to do is to ask the Lord to provide us with a partner somewhere in the world where we can make a difference. Um, Richard Garnett told the story of how much difference, um, more difference money can make in a different place if you move it there um, and invest in a community that's of lower income, a poorer place, and how much difference we can do and how we can build beyond ourselves. So listen, here's my other commitment. It's time for us as a church, as a group of people, to grow in generosity. Until now, I've always had this view that we don't receive money just to kind of give it to another place, but I think I'm wrong. It's time for us, from our general funds, as a church council working together, to find something, to ask the Lord to lead us something, that we might invest in something that is not about our agenda, but is about blessing the world and working for the good of someone else, somewhere else, that it might last beyond our moment. So there are my three things for you. But let me just finish this. Generosity is a journey. It is a journey that we're on. I want to suggest there's like maybe four parts to that journey. The first one is just this, initial giving. Maybe today you've never given anything. And maybe today the invitation is just to initially try it. To try and see what it's like if you've got £10 to give one of them away and see what happens. But that initial step. Maybe God's inviting you today to make an initial step on that journey. Uh, second is to be an intentional giver. You know, to intentionally say, not only am I initially giving something now, but I'm intentionally giving. I'm, I don't know, I'm going to, every month, every quarter, whatever it is, I'm going to intentionally give some of my income away. And thirdly, a proportionate giver. So I'm actually going to set a proportion of my income away. This is what Louise and I do. We're going to set a proportion of our income away every month. And on the first day of the month, we're going to give that to the things that we give to. Um, we use um, the biblical model of 10%, but it's not like a rule, I don't think. It's just a guide, and we use that as our base level. And then the fourth place is to become a radical giver, where you're like, actually, how much should I keep, is the question. Listen, I am not there, but I hope for this. I hope that by the end of my life, whenever that is, I'm able to say, do you know what, I just kind of just keep the little bit that I need and the rest, I kind of just give it away. 
to grow in generosity, to go on a journey. And do you know, you've never met someone who was generous towards other with, with grace and forgiveness and love and hope and acceptance who wasn't also generous with their money. For me, part of it's about saying, look, I want to be radically generous in all areas of my life as I view those around us. So there's my suggestion to you, that these are our values around giving. To be intentional, to give with joy, and to grow in generosity, to invest in those things that really matter to us, to put our treasure where our heart is. If our heart is in following Jesus together, to put our treasure into it. If our heart is in in raising up a generation, to put our treasure into it. If our heart is in standing with those in crises and working with all nations, that we put our treasure into it so that we might play our part, just our part, by the grace of God, we might play our part in seeing individuals, the church and our communities come alive in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.